Focus with Jack Cottle. And good evening, I'm Jack Cotto. Welcome to this month's edition of Focus. This month we're talking about racism here in the Black Hills. Two guests with us to talk about that. Tim Gallego is the editor emeritus of the Native Sun News. He's been in the newspaper business in this area since the late 1970s. And Steve Allender has been the mayor of Rapid City since 2015. He previously spent 29 years with the Rapid City Police Department. A little background on these two. Tim was the major force behind the first year of reconciliation here in South Dakota, along with Governor George Mickelson. Back Back in 1992, honor the victims of the Wounded Knee Massacre and to work toward reconciliation among all citizens here in the state of South Dakota. Steve Allender, part of a mayoral proclamation declaring 2015 as a renewed year of reconciliation here in South Dakota. Now, I'll start with you, Steve. We're talking about racism. When you hear the term racism, what do you see that being? Well, that's, the, that's the question of the year, I think, because it's, uh, I think the definition of racism continues to change. Uh, the true meaning of it, um, you know, and how it plays out in a community uh, can be in, ver in various forms. Uh, when, uh, when we see comments from people disparaging an entire race of people or an individual because of the race that that person is, you know, those are, uh, those are hurtful things for a community, but um, we're in a national uh, uh, kind of a national noise campaign right now about racism and everything else. So uh, it's, it's important for me to uh, focus this back on Rapid City and not get caught up in the national noise. Uh, Tim, when you think of racism, what, what comes to your mind? What do you see that being? Well, I think having uh, been raised in, on a reservation in Pine, Pine Ridge and moving to Rapid City when I was a boy, I probably have experienced it from both sides. And uh, it's, it's uh, coming along. I think we've come a long way back in the old days. I think one of the things uh, I think of quite often is uh, I don't think the mayor's ever been called a dirty little, dirty little white boy. But uh, when I was probably nine years old, a friend of mine named Chuck Trimble came from the reservation. And our moms were bo both working in the Virginia Cafe here in town. Mm -hmm. And we were ventured downtown Rapid City and uh, we came to the Alec Johnson Hotel which had a revolving door and so we said oh that looks like fun so we started to go through it and the doorman grabbed us both and kicked us and said you dirty little Indians and threw us out on the street and I think the irony of that whole story is you, you, you can't ever tell a book by its cover because Chuck Trimble and I are both in the South Dakota Hall of Fame uh, and it's been 27 years now since you and Governor Mickelson are, yeah, 27, on my math is going back. Uh, 27 years now since you guys had that initial year of reconciliation. Do you see those factors that, that drove you to do that then? Do you see, still see those here today? Well, you know, when I interviewed uh, the governor in 1989, the first question I asked him was, what is the toughest job you have as governor? And he said, I'm going to tell you the same thing my father told me when he was governor 40 years ago, race relations between Indians and whites. So that goes back like 68 years then. And uh, so it's, it's been since the South Dakota was a state. And uh, I see more and more of like the mayor, I think he's making extreme effort to bring people together. We've got organizations now that are doing things in town to bring the community together. I went to a meeting, uh, not uh, a week or two ago, people from both races came. Uh, Bruce uh, Longfox was there, and we talked about the issues that we face today and what we can do to overcome them. So we're talking, and I think dialogue is probably one of the most important things we could do right now. Now, Steve, before you were mayor, you saw this on the streets 29 years with the Rapid City Police Department. How have those things changed from when you broke into that business to where we are today? Well, th I think things have changed dramatically. Uh, first of all, we've seen a couple of new generations of people in that time. And uh, when I started uh, working in Rapid City in the mid-80s, uh, there was attention to race relations, but it came in the form of requiring employees to sit through uh, uh, sensitivity training which, uh, by my recollection, my recollection would be, <laughs> um, uh, would be um, uh, an instructor uh, pointing out 
all of the offenses of generations before and pointing out uh, how great the uh, Native Americans were and how bad the non-natives were. And so it, that was projecting a, a feeling among the students in there, primarily white, that uh, there's something wrong with you and that everyone's angry at you. And so I walked out of every one of those training sessions thinking, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm pretty sure this isn't it. Uh, forcing people to hear from angry instructors and put, getting this guilt and all that. It wasn't the right channel of communication. So I, as my career progressed, um, I could see the, uh, the, the, the hurt behind some of the complaints that were received uh, from Native uh, community members against uh, police officers. I could uh, look into some of those uh, situations and really see that all this underlying um, uh, baggage that is resulting in this, uh, this feeling that bubbles to the top. I mean, it was a, it's a ne very negative force in the community. Now, over the years, politically, there's been a number of uh, political things done to try to put some window dressing on it. And none of those, I think, have worked. And so when I became mayor in 2015, and as part of my campaign, I kind of said that, uh, you know, uh, publicizing this, a politician speaking about this is not going to be the cure. And so I vowed not to politicize race from the mayor's office. It's a community issue that can only be solved by community members. Uh, but what, what really uh, I felt like was a big imp impediment to that was uh, uh, the fact that we couldn't talk about it. Uh, because if we talked about it, I might say the word Indian instead of Native American, or I might say something that I didn't know could be offensive, so therefore I wouldn't say it at all. And so we just had this lack of dialogue. And so what I've tried to do over the past two years is just open up the channels of communication and say, look, we're all people here. We've all gotten here for some reason with all of our life experiences. Let's just be open and honest with each other. People say dumb things around each other all the time. Let's, let's don't be embarrassed by that. Let's don't be threatened by it. Let's get the conversation out on the table, hear how we feel, hear what we think the problems and solutions are, and then we can move forward so what I have witnessed then uh, from that are the, some community groups, probably some of the same ones that Tim has observed, have taken this uh, as part of their new mission. And they're community groups, so they're getting together having conversations and talking and making friends. So uh, it's one thing to bang on a keyboard and say, this is how I feel, but a totally different thing to stand in a room of people and look someone in the eye and say, this is how I feel. It, 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 is, uh, it is misheard and misinterpreted unless you are locking eyes during that conversation. So I feel glad that we are this far. Uh, my overall assessment is that race relations in Rapid City are improving, but it's a teaspoon at a time rather than a gallon at a time. It's, it's in small pieces, but small significant pieces that over time I think we could project a great deal of improvement uh, over the coming years. Tim, do you feel like we're having that dialogue and do you feel, what kind of progress do you feel like is being made here? Well, you know, uh, I think probably for the first time ever the Chamber of Commerce is going to give the George Award to Bruce Longfox, who has done a lot in this community and is still doing a lot. So uh, that's a step. Now, I think uh, as as Native Americans, uh, we need to become involved in the community. We need to have people run for the city offices. We need to have people run for the school board. The only way we're going to in initiate any change is really is to become a part of the process. And so that's what I'm encouraging a lot of our people to do is get in there and run for office. Uh, let people know at least you have a platform to get up and talk about how you feel about things and the kind of changes you'd like to see made. All right, we will have to take a break. We'll continue our look at racism here in the area when we come back with this month's edition of Focus. 
I'm Jack Cattle. Welcome back to this month's edition of Focus. We're talking about racism here in the area. Tim Gallego is the editor emeritus of the Native Sun News here in Rapid City. Tim, we talked about some of the progress that we've made, but what are the areas that we still have got to work on the most? Well, you know, I think we get tied up sometimes, like the mayor was saying just now, about uh, what, are we, what are we supposed to call ourselves? And uh, Sitting Bull said, I was born an Indian, I'm going to die an Indian. And I'm probably one of the last holdovers that see nothing wrong with using the word Indian. I kind of blanch a little bit when they say native, and that seems to replace everything now because uh, a native could be anybody in Rapid City is a native of Rapid City. So we, we're, we're, I think, getting too politically correct sometimes in these things. And uh, I don't mind being called an Indian. If you go out of the reservation right now and you find an elder and ask him, what, what is your race? He'll say Indian with, without shame. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way it is. Uh, Steve Allender is the mayor of Rapid City. Where do you see progress is still got to be made? Where are our, our, our weak points? Well, I think um, we still have some weak points in the areas of perception. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, the kind of the predetermined idea of how I must feel since I'm white-skinned or how someone must feel because they're brown-skinned. Uh, we have, um, we have a, I, think, I think all of our nerves are raw uh, at times in this community because of uh, social media and the type of national dialogue that's going on surrounding the president and all of the uh, tweets and the comments and that sort of thing. So I think that our, our weak area is giving too much attention to the outside world and not enough to our own community. Um, I, I, uh, you know, one of the areas that I would have said we were lacking in just a year ago was that the, you know, the Native American uh, the elder is a highly respected uh, person in the Native community. And you'll see some real traditional um, uh, folks who will not speak if an elder's in the room. They won't make eye contact. They will be very respectful mm -hmm. of the elder. So I, I've always thought, where are the elders in this discussion? How come we're talking, we're reduced to talking to an activist or uh, these type of things? But I'm happy to say in the last year or probably longer, maybe as much as two years, we've had more elders coming to the table and stepping up and saying, it's time for me to get involved in this conversation. And I think the key to race relations in Rapid City is really centered on the, the native elders coming to the table because they command respect not only of the uh, native community, but also the non-native community. These are the folks that have been through it. No, the, a 20-year-old native kid today doesn't have the same story Tim has about where he's been and how he was raised and all the things he experienced. That's valuable information. And, but that 20-year-old kid's going to listen to Tim when he talks. So uh, I think that when, when we're all at the table, when the, when the elders are, are here and stepping up, I think we are uh, at, the, we're at, the, the, at the foot of a gold mine uh, here in terms of progress. So I'm really excited about that. What about young kids? I mean, obviously the young kids are the ones who don't have these ideas in their heads until right. somebody puts them there. How do you hit the young kids and how do you get them going in the right direction now? Well, that's a good question and probably a question that uh, 100 people would answer all differently. Um, as far as uh, the young kids, you know, they are gonna learn. Uh, young kids are not born with the ability or the knowledge of how to use swear words or bad manners. They are taught those things. So they're not born with racism. They are taught those things. They're not born with bias and prejudice. So uh, I kind of see this happening, you know, uh, on both sides uh, uh, of the equation, uh, that we have to be mindful of what we're teaching our children. We have to make sure that our children are being brought up in safe uh, uh, households and safe neighborhoods and safe schools, that they're getting uh, the proper education they need, uh, that they're getting a fair shot at the world by not only their parents, but all of the people in the neighborhood, all the people who have contact with them throughout the day. So whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, 
A child will grow up and be tomorrow's attitude about how we perceive each other. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, with many problems, I think part of the problem is a, a generation leaving us now and then. Uh, so through attrition, we get through some of the worst attitudes uh, and that we have a new opportunity with a new generation to have good attitudes and those positive uh, contributions. So, Tim, as you look at it, how important is it to get to the kids and how do you do that? Well, you know, uh, Mayor Barnett, Don Barnett, uh, used to love the, the musical South Pacific. And he always came to a part in, in the play where the uh, Marine officer was singing and he said, it has to be drummed in their dear little ear. They have to be carefully taught when he's talking about racism. And uh, so I think we're trying to teach the kids now out on the reservation not only their own language, but also to learn to uh, live in the entire system, the entire uh, race, uh, covey of races that we have in South Dakota. So back in, going back to 1972 when we had our flood, um, a lot of the Native Americans lived along the creek and they got flooded out. The mayor asked all the motels to open up rooms for them. A lot of the motels refused to let Native Americans who had just lost everything they owned to go into the hotels. And he had to step up and take charge. And he did an admirable job because Rapid City could have been a tinderbox back then. So it, it takes strong leadership, I think, to bring about any change. I think uh, Mayor uh, George Mickelson, the governor, is a good example of that. It took a strong man to do what he did as a Republican back 20 some years ago. All right, we've got to take another break. We will finish up our look at racism here in the area when we come back with this month's edition of Focus. And good evening, I'm Jack Cotter. Welcome back to this month's edition of Focus, talking about racism here in the area. Tim Gallego is the editor emeritus of the Native Sun News. You know, talking about 27 years ago when you got this started with Governor Mickelson, one thing you did not have was social media. Back then, if you had something ugly to say, you had to come out of your house, go out and say it. Now you can relatively anonymously just do it from your living room how big of a change is that? Because our Facebook page, we have a very large band list, and it is a very racially diverse band list as well. How, do you, how does that stuff play into that, all of this? Well, you know, I'm not a great fan of, of social media. Uh, I'm old-fashioned that way. I, I, it took me a long time to even get a Facebook page, which I did about five months ago. And I had to take, I shut it down, backed away from it, because some nasty comments were coming on it that I, I didn't feel were appropriate, uh, at least not to me. So I got it back going again simply because I have children on it and I keep up with what my kids are doing, living all over the country. But uh, I think it, it's a good thing in a lot of ways, um, but it's scary because in the newspaper business, I think it's damaging my business an awful lot. Uh, people get their news a lot from the media, social media rather than going out and buying a newspaper. So I think a lot of newspapers in America uh, are a little afraid of social media. And look what it did uh, to uh, during the elections. There were a lot of things on, the, on Facebook that were very hurtful and very damaging to some of the candidates. Steve Allender is the mayor of Rapid mm -hmm. City. As you look at uh, as social media, it gives people an easy forum for whatever pops into their head. It's a place for it to go now. How, how has that changed the landscape of racism, do you think? Well, it's changed the landscape of everything. Uh, one thing that's not required when posting to social media, and that is sources. Uh, there's uh, no, no, um, no requirement that what you're posting is true. In fact, the most popular posts are inflammatory posts. So, um, and I think that's really the goal for some uh, news agencies or individuals uh, to post something that will get people stirred up and making those comments. And so, uh, you know, you live by the sword and you die by the sword. Uh, social media has been good for uh, communication, generally speaking. But it also comes with the uh, fake news sources, the stories that are immediately uh, found to be untrue. There's more of that than there is network news or local news. And 
So uh, I think all that contributes to uh, the problem with race relations here in the community. Um, you can scour YouTube and find uh, 30 minutes of videos of cops beating up racial minorities. And you can post that and say, look at the terrible world we live in. People will watch that video and say, oh my gosh, they're right. Uh, we're, we're, we're not the same country we were when my father was born or uh, something of that nature. And so, uh, so it's completely out of context. There are those videos, but uh, it's not a popular thing to use your phone to take a video of someone doing something right or doing something that's not funny or doing something that's uh, important in someone else's life. It's about mistakes. It's about dumb things, and those things are exploited. Uh, earlier, uh, in a week or so ago, a state representative posted a meme on Facebook that got her in all kinds of trouble, got her let go from a business uh, uh, and all kinds of uh, fallout from it. And it was deemed to be racist. Uh, and so th all of that hurts the, the situation. And uh, again, if we have too much attention on what's going on on the outside world and not enough here, uh, we're in big trouble. And what I say is that the, the entire nation is made up of local communities. And if we would all just pay attention to the borders of our local community first, uh, we could make a better nation. And uh, we're not doing that. We're doing the opposite. All right. We're running out of time. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Tim, where do we go from here? What's the next step we have to do to take the next step forward? Well, focus on what the mayor was just saying. Um, you know, at, at least when something's in a newspaper, you have resurgent for the most part. And if one of your writers writes something that uh, doesn't turn out to be 100% correct, people like the mayor, and he has, they respond to it. I give them a spot in the, in the paper to respond to it. The chief of police, Carl, has responded to something he saw that he didn't like, and he wrote a column addressing it so I think that's the main focus and uh, uh, I think we're we're gonna have to all understand that with, with the social media it's gonna bring out a lot of people uh, with a lot of anger and a lot of hate and we're just gonna have to learn to, to, to get around that and uh, concentrate on the things that are good that are happening and I'll probably be criticized for sitting here and talking to the mayor but uh, I know he's a good man. He's trying to do the best he can in a tough situation, and I, I support him. All right. Uh, Steve, what do you think? What's the next step? What do we have to do to keep moving forward in this? I think the next step is we have to expose our hearts. We have to, we have to give of ourselves into this conversation. We have to focus internally on the community. We have to build relationships with the uh, other uh, important members of this community who can affect change. Uh, no single leader can wave a wand and do this. We all have to work together, and I think the cooperation and the relationships are, are vitally important, and nothing can be accomplished without that. You guys both feel like we're going in the right direction, at least? Yeah, we just need more of our young people to get up and, and start uh, facing the issues that we, we face for generations, and follow in our footsteps. Let us lead you. You think we're going in the right direction? I agree. The future is bright for Rapid City and for race uh, relations. And uh, it's all really going to have to do with, uh, with our different generations of people coming together. All right. I think we've solved all of the problems here in this half hour. Very, <laughs> very neatly wrapping them up. Um, Rapid City Mayor Steve Allender and uh, Native Sun News Editor Emeritus Tim Gallego. And uh, now you're retired still. I've never called the paper and had you not be there even though you've been retired for about 10 years now. So keep up the hard work. It's hard to retire. Tim doesn't right. know how to retire. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Hope to see you again the first Sunday night of next month. Good night.